I think um, I like my definition of creativity as ability to deal with unknowns. Um, that's my working definition uh, of what a creative person is. It's it's not even like, are you a great writer? It's can you deal with unknowns and do you are, do you embrace unknowns? Hey, everybody. Thanks again for hitting that play button. This is another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Uh, Before I get to today's episode, I just want to say thank you to whoever keeps buying from my Amazon affiliate links. It helps out a ton. It helps the podcast out. It helps me out. So, again, that's in the show notes. Uh, So whoever just spent a couple hundred dollars on IT stuff, uh, I don't know who you are, but thank you very much. Uh, You know, on this episode of the podcast... We're going to talk about a couple of things, and uh, one of which is college. And for those of you who have listened for a while, you know college is a very, very sore spot for me. Uh, I mean, I will be very honest. I think my college experience was pretty much a waste of time and money. Uh, You know, half the time I have to explain to people what my college is because it's a, uh, a private Catholic university. Uh, you know, when I started going there, it was very open. It wasn't the whole, I'm not, you know, Catholic. I, 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 I never had, um, a Catholic upbringing or anything. The reason I went there was it was a safety school. And as time went on, I got stuck there because they used to let all those uh, credits transfer. Well, (laughs) by the time I actually wanted to, you know, leave every time, you know, it was like, nope, you can't transfer anywhere. Our our credits don't transfer anywhere anymore because the school had been degraded so much and everyone knew it. Uh, you know, I had two mentors when I started going to college who both told me if I didn't have that that bachelor's degree, then I was absolutely worthless in the workplace. Well, I still feel worthless in the workplace. Uh, you know, a lot of those entry level jobs are gone. They've been replaced by unpaid internships. And, you know, a lot of places don't want to hire anymore because they're afraid of the 2008 uh, bubble. Uh, happening again and having to lay off half their staff. Uh, You know, it's just a very tricky time right now. So if I had a kid, if I was, uh, you know, a parent and I had a a kid and they were 17, 18, I'd say this. You're not going to go to college. Instead, you're going to take some online classes, which are 10, 20, 30 bucks, depending. There's Udemy, EDX, Coursia, Khan Academy, which we're going to talk about today, uh, Skillshare, YouTube, you know, all these places where you can learn all these skills for a fraction of going to college. And these are by people actually out there doing it and not professors who, you know, have gotten tenure and they're not, you know, out there learning anymore because why do they need to? You know, they've got tenure. They're making, you know, so I would have them go learn these online courses. You want to learn uh, Photoshop? Okay, great. You know, we'll, we'll uh, spend the 20 bucks a month and we'll get, you know, Adobe Creative Suite. Or you, if you don't have that money, get GIMP. It's a free Photoshop alternative. Uh, you can learn uh, uh, cinematography by going by grabbing your camera and, and uh, using your phone. I know it's not as good as a DSLR, but you're learning the shots and you're learning what an, what, a, what the f-stop and the I/O, uh, uh, the the the, um, the the camera eye, the, all this stuff. You're learning all this and you're making free mistakes, which is key. You don't want to make expensive mistakes. And you can listen to this podcast, which is 100 percent free. And you have tons of guests that I have on here who are out there doing it, and this is all 100 percent free. You can go find their work, find their portfolio. I keep saying I just don't see the need for college anymore. And I got into it with Ramit Sethi. Um, you know, Ramit is, is a uh, wrote a really good book called "I Will Teach You to Be Rich," which I'll link to in the show notes. But you know, Ramit and I, and I said, Ramit, I, I just don't see the point in this college deg- degrees anymore. It just it, it, and I, what I said to him was that it's only as a college degree is only as uh, is only as good as its ability to get you a job. He disagreed on that. Well, what's the point of going to college then if you're not there to get a job? I, you know, it, the, this experience, it, it's not a day camp, right? You're not spending, you know, $30,000 or $20,000 or $10,000 a semester to go to some, to go to like a summer camp, a Trump dump summer camp. You're going there to learn skills that will get you paid and, and, and get you, uh, so you can go move into your profession, right? Well, if it doesn't do that, then it was a complete failure. And I think that the college bubble is the next thing to burst. You heard it here first. I, I've said that for a while now. Uh, you know, and, and honestly, if you disagree with me, I completely understand. A lot of people still love college, and they think, Dave, you just, they say to me, Dave, you just had a bad experience. They said, you just had a, one bad experience. Don't let that get you down. And college is still valuable. Maybe I'm wrong. 
Uh, who the hell knows? Ask any girl I've ever dated. I'm a complete idiot. But anyways, on to more, uh, on to more things and, and, and some very more, more positive things. The, my guest today actually teaches at, at Khan Academy, and he's the producer for Pixar in a Box. Uh, an amazing course. It's 100% free, by the way. Wink, wink. Uh, and then my, uh, then my guest also teaches computer science. He teaches cryptography. Uh, I mean, brilliant, brilliant guy. This is episode 135 with guest Britt Cruz. Britt, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Hey, Dave. Happy to be speaking with you. So, uh, you know, Britt, you have such a unique background. I mean, you, you know, you're involved in so many great things. So I, I want to know, when you were growing up, did you always have this sort of this love of, of not only teaching, but also of creative problem solving and sort of like computer science? Yeah, as a kid, like like most people involved in filmmaking, um, very early on, I got obsessed with, you know, the home video cameras. And as soon as I got my hands on VCRs, I started trying to cut together videos, you know, starting with family vacations and whatnot. And, but very soon, what I realized early on is the kinds of videos I was making uh, once I moved beyond the family videos were explanation style videos um kind of similar to what was on tv at the time i grew up with bill nye so i kind of bent that way and very quickly i realized that you know i could hand in school projects in video form i kind of forced my teachers to do that and i i kind of found my way into explanation style videos really early even though it wasn't my one passion but it's something that came up right away you you mentioned the home video cameras you know a lot of guests also had that that same uh, childhood experience where they're picking up you know the super 8 cameras uh or, or maybe even a little later like the big VHS box uh, camcorders and start you know then that's how they got their start in you know in making their own films totally i i remember my setup now was i had two vcrs for editing and to mix sound in i ran i had i had an early computer thanks to my uh, my mom and I would run um, an audio cable with a mic jack going to RCA cables running diagonally across the room into the VCR so I could mix sound from the computer and video from the VCRs. And that was my first setup. Oh, that's actually brilliant. <laughs> that was fun. I mean, especially for, I mean, because what were you, seven or eight at the time? Yeah, six, seven. I mean, that's a brilliant idea for a kid to come up with. Uh, which explains a lot about you, Brett. I mean, it's like uh, I think that's why you know you're you know you're in, in the position you are. You have to, those those moments of brilliance. And, and you know when, when I when we talk about computers, what kind of computer was it, Brett? Was it like one of those old Apple IIs, or was it something similar? No, my friend had an Apple. I had one of the early box computers. It was a my actually my mom had an early Tandy laptop, one of the first laptops. Uh, so I grew up on DOS, but then the the computer I'm describing. I remember it was a given from a friend of my dad's, and it was a big, boxy one. I don't know, but it was before, like, the compact Presario wave. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, you know, I mean, did you ever t I mean, do you still have that computer laying around, like, somewhere in storage? No, no, that one's so gone. <laughs> I actually, uh, maybe a couple months ago, I was going through stuff, and I had my, I still have my first computer that I got. And I was a little late to the party with it, but I, you know, my first computer was in the '90s, uh, probably the late '90s, and I remember pulling this thing out, and my God, I, I look at it and go, "How the hell did I use this thing? It's <laughs> it seems so archaic, and it's huge, and I'm like, you know, it's a it only uses a 56k modem. When you're passionate, though, yeah, nothing else, anything will get you to, anything will work, any tool will work if you're motivated. <laughs> That's a great saying, Brent. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep that uh, because I'm gonna, I, that is a, a a great piece of advice. You know, um, because mainly I use it, you know, for for writing too. 
And uh, I mean, I, I even had word processors that I remember using. And I looked at some of them, you know, the other day I was looking through, uh, not not in person, but online, some of the old word processors. And I'm like, man, the size of these things are like a piece of luggage. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, we had a typewriter, too. Yeah, I, I know some people who you know who are younger listening to this have no clue what a typewriter is, but uh, but I've used a typewriter, Brett. I remember the you remember when you had to change the uh, if you made a mistake, you had to put that like uh, little card in to sort of backspace it out, wait it yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I wish I still had a typewriter. Actually, it's a it's a nice way to focus, stay focused. Yeah, you know, I, I was saying that to somebody else the other day, you know, it, it's like laptops are great, you know, phones are great, but the problem is, is that it's too easy to, to get distracted with them because of the internet. Yeah, the context switch is the real killer. Uh, it just, that's the number one thing people waste time on. They probably, if they count it in a day, when I say context switch, I mean an interruption of any kind, doing one thing and then doing another, if you do that hundreds of times to, per day, it's a few minutes per switch you waste, and that's why people waste three to four hours a day. Um, early on, about six years ago or seven years ago, I noticed this, and one day I just threw my phone out, and I never looked back. I've never owned a smartphone, and that's, again, one of my great time savers. So do you just have a flip phone now or no phone at all? I, don't, I have a landline. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, you know, uh, there was a program that I, I – you know, I had um, – uh, couple different people on the podcast and we, we were always talking about this because some people have to use a laptop and uh for their work and some people need internet for their research but you know even when i'm trying to do it sometimes the phone the phone is the biggest distraction for me the, the laptop not so much because the phone you know you're always being you're always at someone's beck and call which i think you know some days I'm, I, I say to myself brett i go you know what if i could take a a vacation and not carry my phone with me i don't think you know what i mean i think that would be a real vacation because if i went on a, a vacation somewhere and i had to carry my phone or my laptop around it would it would there'd be no point to it no so uh you know taking a break from the phone as is, is something that you know i i have found is important just leaving it in another room turning it off completely uh, and for the laptop, there's a program i found called anti-social and there's also right. uh, another one called um uh, I forget what it's called, but it's it's by the same people who make antisocial, and basically it just blocks out certain websites, so that way you can't access them. Yep, and I often just have days where I turn the internet off, and it's really it really helps. Yeah, it definitely does. And uh, you know, so so Brett, what, what does a normal day for you look like? Like, what what how is your day structured in terms of when you're creating and teaching and all and, and doing all the things that you do? I try to break up my day into two halves. Um, so I, I really hate scheduling meetings and, and breaking up a day into hours and half hour chunks. I only work well in half thinking about a day in two runs of, of creation. So there's a morning creation phase and there's an afternoon creation phase. And then otherwise I try to bucket all my actual meetings on one day. So that's what I really try to do. So I have a day where I'm just sitting around on meetings. And then the other two days, if, the other four days of the week, if things are going well, I am just locked into one task and staying on that for two to three hours, then a break, bike ride, two to three hours, and then your day's done. I, I Now I have two kids now. I don't work past four o'clock. If you're working, I used to work late at night. And once I stopped doing that, it, it really helped because it helped focus me so that at the beginning of the week, if I know I'm done at four, I really have to write out the day before what I want to accomplish the next day. And, and that has kept me very organized. So it seems to be that, you know, if you if you stop working at four, you're so focused on getting it done. That means meaning that there is it, it, it's like you have a window of opportunity. And in that yes. window of opportunity, you, you say, OK, it's it, it begins here. It ends here. And in the middle is where I have to do all the do where I have to do all my work, because once four o'clock hits, the window is closed. Exactly. So you, I really cherish those those two to three hour chunks and I'll. And during those chunks, I'll either, depending on the type of work I'm doing, if I don't need a computer, I'm out on my bike, bike to the river, sit by the river, work on paper. That's where I get my best work done. Often I'm on the computer. If I can, I take my laptop somewhere. I go to the coffee shop and work. And otherwise, when I'm stuck in an editing hole, then I'm at home in my office editing. I will, one caveat is, yeah, when 
when you're anyone who is at an editor, it's very hard to stop working. So there are the days, there are the very scary weeks where you can't even count how many hours you spend editing. And, and that happens to me. So, and it so, goes all night. So, Britt, when you're using that pen and paper, so are you just grabbing a notebook and, and just an, a pen, you know, and you're just, you know, tr you know, writing ideas as they come and you're working on projects. It, it, do you ever have a problem maybe transcribing that back to the laptop? No, actually, I never. But I often do things in layers. So I'll, I'll, I'll write a bunch of scribbles that don't always make a lot of sense. What I find is just the process of writing is more important than what you even have on that page because it's my form of building memory. So I'll go out, write something down, and I'll have six pages of chicken scratch look like a crazy person. But then I, I'll just leave that in my bag. The next day, I'll go out and write again what I was working on. I'll try to simplify it into some sort of bullet point thing. And then by the time I get back to the laptop, I usually have you know, a readable piece of paper. But even if those papers blew away, it would be fine because the process of writing on a paper for me helped me build and clarify my thinking. And then I can just sit down on that laptop and bang out, you know, a script of whatever I'm doing in a, in a very focused flow. Um, thinking now just out loud, if I was trying to do that on a laptop from the beginning, it, I would never get anything done because I would, again, I would be switching context. I wouldn't be on the page. Yeah, you know, the only because I mean, I love notebooks and writing using an actual pen. Uh, the, the the biggest challenge that I mean, I, I face is trying to get that writing back onto a laptop. You know what I mean? Because now you're transcribing, you know what I mean? And now it, I always find it. It's a little it feels a little redundant sometimes to me because you're, you, you feel like you're doing the same work you just did, if you know what I mean. Totally. I guess I should clarify when I'm writing, I'm all, often just drawing pictures and doodling I'm not actually writing down sentence for sentence and then transcribing. Yeah, that wouldn't work. Once I'm at that level of I can actually write down the words of, for example, a narration, I'm on the computer. So it's, it's really that brainstorm phase, structure phase, I stay on the page. So, so Brett, what are some of the bigger projects that you can talk about that you're working on right now? Um, so in the... In one world, I am working on year three of Pixar in a Box, which is a, a really big, very exciting project. Um, the goal here of this project is to show how the movie-making process at Pixar works, but more specifically, how things that kids are learning in school are used at Pixar in the making of their films. Um, so Pixar in a Box has been structured over three years. Year one, we focused on the math connections. So what do you learn in math class that they actually use at Pixar, for example, in particle simulations to make water? They're using Newton's equations from physics. So, you know, that boring stuff you're learning in school that seems boring when it's presented to you is used in this very exciting domain. Um, year two of Pixar in a Box focused more on science, the connections, the connections to science. Right now, I'm working on the last lesson, which is a hair simulation lesson. Um, how they simulate hair at Pixar? Well, it uses a mass spring system, which is Hooke's Law, another thing you hit in school. Uh, but most exciting, and we're writing right now, is year three of Pixar in a Box. Is really the whole point of it is going to be called The Art of Storytelling. Um, so that will be a storytelling curriculum. We purposely pushed that one last because I always knew it would be the hardest one to, to make work online. Yeah, you know what? That's actually, you know, from from just my standpoint, that's the one I would really like to be to 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 see. Uh, just, not because I'm not interested in, in in animation or how Pixar does everything, but just from a you know a screenwriting storytelling perspective, you know, everybody is always interested to see how Pixar does what they do. Yes, and, and we're all so excited about the pressures on to make sure this is is really strong. Um, the and the one the one hard part is with year one and two with pick the cool thing about Pixar in a box is it's a, a fully interactive very engaging experience you're not just watching a video and then doing a test you are watching a short clip then playing with a piece of interactive software you saw in that clip and then you follow along video exercise video exercise um, you're participating throughout and creating throughout so for example with that water simulation lesson. Not only are you learning how they do it, you are making your own particle simulator along the way. Um, that's easy to kind of conceptualize in math and science. But in the storytelling world, again, it's very hard to think about online activities you're going to do in between learning about their storytelling process. 
Uh, so that's really the challenge is, is really figuring out, okay, it's, it won't be too hard to make really great videos that communicate how storytelling works at Pixar and how the individual storytellers, what their process is. What will be hard is the handoff to the user to say, okay, now it's your turn. Now it's your turn because the goal of our storytelling curriculum is pretty ambitious. It is you start with nothing, you go through six lessons, and at the end, you have storyboarded your own short. So that's that's the scope is people leave this lesson with a storyboarded short on paper. And, and, and so that's the goal. And that's where we are still working on the steps to get you there. That, that's absolutely amazing, Brett. That is that is see, you know, I, I see a lot of screenwriting courses online from from all different people and, and all different you know places. And and the, the crux of it is at the end. You don't really do, you know what I mean? You should be, in my opinion, creating something as you're going, you know, even if it's a treatment, if it's an outline, that's why when you said it's going to be a storyboard for your own short, that is killer. That is key because you should be creating as you're learning. So you you, you know what I mean? Like you learn and create, create and you learn, right? Exactly. It's, it's exciting to hear your excitement. I just got some goosebumps because I'm like, yes, we got to push forward on this. <laughs> you could go back to Pixar and be like, Dave Bullis really likes us. And they'll say, who is that? <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, no, it's amazing what, 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 what Pixar is doing. And I wanted to ask you, you know, as we talk about Pixar in a box, you know, how did you become a producer of, of Pixar in a, in a box? Um, backing up, I was, well, immediately I was working at Khan Academy and, and what I was doing there at the time is thinking of how we could co-produce content with partners. Um, and I dipped my feet a little bit in with NASA the year before where we kind of looked at all of NASA's content and thought, OK, what can we do to kind of curate this and make it work on Khan Academy? So it was, you know, aligned to standards and, and it was, you know, an interesting linear flow. Um, but the NASA project was really a curation one, looking at what they had. And then and NASA is such a big organization. There's just all these different departments that make educational content. So it's like grabbing from a thousand things, trying to find the 20 that work and putting that into a lesson format. That was like a baby first step in experimenting how we could work with partners. And, and then right around that, the time that ended, um, someone at Khan Academy Kit Haraski is used to work at Pixar and said, you know, there's someone at Pixar who's, you know, interested in maybe doing something with us. And at the time, uh, Tony DeRose is the chief scientist at Pixar, was doing a TED talk and, a, and he has a talk called Math in the Movies, which is like a one hour talk talking about, you know, what you learn at school is relevant at Pixar. And he they were working on a physical exhibit, the science behind Pixar, which is now traveling around the, the U.S. I, I saw it in Boston last so he had this he had this one hour talk, which was successful. Then it became a museum exhibit with a bunch of interactive things you could do. But then his next vision was we want to reach more people by, by creating some sort of online version of what I'm trying to do in the museum. And what was really exciting is in that first meeting when they came in, I was like, yes, I have to be in that meeting. Um, they didn't have any idea what they were going to do yet. It was just like, we know we want to do something online. We know our guiding principle, but we don't know what the thing we're putting online is. So it was this opportunity to work, work on an exciting project that was a blank slate from the beginning. And that's, and I was like, no one could stop me at that point, jumping in and, and grabbing the reins. Yeah. I mean, cause you know, you look at Pixar in a box and it just looks, you know, so well put together. There's so many talented people working on that. You, you know, has there ever been a challenge while working on Pixar in a box that that it's it's almost beyond sort of a, a like a resources standpoint, or if you know what I mean, Britt? Um, wait, can you repeat the question just so I'm, I'm clear? When you say resources, what do you mean? Uh, like maybe there's not enough people, maybe there's not enough time. Uh, you know, just something that maybe like there was a, a, an, an element to Pixar in a box that maybe somebody wanted to to implement, but they just couldn't, you know, either through time or, or just didn't have enough, you know, time or people to do it. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, everything about the project has been a challenge, but they're all great challenges because the project is fun. So it started right with, A, getting funding for this project was difficult. But once Disney uh, eventually funded it, that gave the freedom to actually spend some time conceptualizing 
what the lessons would be. And that's we that is where we wasted. I don't want to say wasted because it was development. That's where the majority of our time went initially. What is this lesson look like? And we actually just a small group of us um, rebuilt the same lesson, which is our environment modeling lesson, like four or five times over and over and over until we could find a model that worked. So the, the and the challenge there is at Khan Academy, we're about, you know, producing stuff fast, low quality. It's not about production value. It's about, you know, being clear and being engaging and being personalized content. Pixar came in needing a very specific uh, bar to be hit in terms of production values. And the hard part was finding that middle ground between something that Pixar thought was visually appealing enough, but Khan Academy thought was you know fast enough to produce that we could actually scale this out and not waste all year on one video um, and, and finding that middle ground blending live action and blending graphics was really hard but once we found that middle ground in terms of production we were able to crank out the other lessons fairly quickly in terms of uh, lessons i've worked on before like we, we really managed to find a system that we could crank these out and, and you also uh Pixar in a Box has a has a podcasting element, which I think is a phenomenal idea as well. Mm -hmm. Because I I think podcasting, you know, that uh, as soon as they can get the you know, there's the video element uh, through the you know video and audio through the Khan Academy, those those lessons, and then also I mean having that that audio element, so that way you know if someone's out for a walk at the gym, they can still put that on and, and hear a whole nother aspect, you know, because it's just you know they're busy doing whatever, but they're they're uh, they can have time to listen. Totally. Um, and that reminds me that one of the, again, it's just all challenges. Another challenge was who would be in these videos and would it be one person throughout? Would it be multiple people? Having multiple people is a very tough scheduling problem. Ultimately, we went for someone different in each lesson and ultimately two or three people. And that was very difficult to schedule, but it was so worth it because it's so nice now to look at that content and anywhere you dive in, you're going to meet somebody new and it's very authentic. So, you know, as, as we talk about challenges with Pixar in a Box, you know, what was the, the biggest challenge that you faced and, and, and how did you overcome that? Um, let me think for a moment. So, well, you know, while you're thinking, I, I'll just, you know, uh, just add, you know, uh, I, I a creative problem solving, you know, somebody once told me that anybody can write a check, you know, but but the real the real sort of mark of a good producer or a good anybody is the creative problem solving. And, and it sounds like to me, Britt, that you are full of creative ideas and full of, of just genius ways to sort of figure out problems that don't require, you know, just, OK, you know, we'll just, you know, here's money. We'll, we'll you do that way. I, <laughs> I think you're a guy that sort of puts his you know, thinks not only analytically, but also thinks on, on different planes about how we can actually creatively solve problems. That helped me think of what it was. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no problem. My, my ramblings help somebody. I'm glad, Brett. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, um, in terms, so one thing was at the time, Khan Academy's exercise platform um, only allowed certain kinds of questions, right? Like uh, from multiple choice to dragging a point around a grid uh, ordering boxes, the type of questions you do when you do a math qu uh, test. But we clearly wanted the exercises to be very different. We wanted you to actually be doing things and working on simulated pieces of software that people at Pixar use. That was my goal. Like, let's look at the software you guys are using and let's build a stripped down version of that. And we've done that for things. Like, we have a color correction suite. We have an animation suite. We have all this stuff. But it was stripping them down to the very core elements. So, you know, any animation suite has a billion buttons, takes forever to learn. We had to build an animation suite that would work within like a minute. So we stripped everything away except, you know, there's keyframes and a play button. Um, and you can do linear interpolation or, or, or Bezier interpolation. Um, what are the functions, the essential functions needed to simulate that software? Then figure out a way to actually make those simulated environments work on Khan Academy, which is a whole issue in building that out on the back end. But coupled to that, the opportunity I saw in that in working on these very complex interactive exercises is there was a free thing that came out of it, which is the graphics we needed in the video, which is I was always worried about how are we going to do graphics for 200 videos? It's so much work is and with iteration, it's just a nightmare. I realized I put a, a stake in the ground and said, 
all the graphics in all our videos will be screen captures of the exercises. So the pieces of software we build that you get to play with going through the exercises, that's the visuals you see in the video, about 95%. There's some other ones you have to make on top of it. But it was really great because it meant there was a ton of legwork to build the software for the interactive exercises that are really fun and visually appealing. But then when it came to video production, it was really just a matter of cutting together a live action shoot with screen grabs from an exercise. And then, boom, um, it just eliminated a whole job of having a full time graphics person. Yeah, and and that see that's that amazing uh, creative problem solving I was talking about. You seem like a guy, uh, Britt. Well, actually, I know you're a guy who can who can just think on the fly like that, and just sort of you know, even when you're in brainstorming sessions, you know, because I, I I think with with projects like Pixar in a Box, I, I could see a lot of sort of you know obstacles and. Just, just, just both creatively, financially, like you said, you know, uh, you know, Disney had to finance it, and I'm, and, you know, and just, just, I think, you know, having those the, that creative ability adds so much that it's almost, you know, it's unquantifiable. You know what I mean? I think um, I like my definition of creativity as ability to deal with unknowns. Um, that's my working definition uh, of what a creative person is. It's, it's not even like, are you a great writer? It's, can you deal with unknowns and do you, are, do you embrace unknowns? So this project was great. It was all unknowns, but the driving force was that vision of what it will be at the end was so strong that it was like this, oh yeah, this project was me saying, I'm sending this back to my 12 year old self. Cause I remember like anyone, when the first time you see toy story, everyone has a story about that. I was in grade eight, toy story came out. I told my teacher, we got to do animation. And he's like, we don't even know where to start. And I remember going to buy 3D Movie Maker, which is a really old 3D modeling uh, program. Great, great software. And like convinced my teacher to buy it and he put it on all the computers. But then there was a question of like, now what do we do? And that whole headache of a year with Toy Story and trying to integrate it into the classroom, like regurgitated when I had this Pixar meeting. And I'm like, here's the chance to actually do something that is fully aligned to, to those films that inspire kids. So that having that end goal allows you to just blow through all the challenges because you're just like, you know where you're headed. You know, I, I really like that definition of creativity. So it, so your definition of creativity is how you deal with unknowns. I like, would say ability. Sorry to cut you off. Okay. The definition would be the ability to deal with unknowns. The ability to deal with unknowns. So let's just say we're, you know, we're, we're writing, uh, you know, Brett, and, you know, as we we're writing – so we're sort of putting pieces of a puzzle together, you know, uh, you know, both both consciously and subconsciously, you know, we're trying, you know, uh, we're trying to fit all this together. Do you think that, you know, maybe creativity is sort of as we're going, actually writing in that moment and just things are coming up naturally? You know, do you think that would probably be like the purest form of creativity? Yeah, because at every step. It's like there's a branching effect. At every step, there's a multiple options, which is a branch of things. And then each option leads to other options. And it just branches out so quickly. There's so many avenues you can go down. Um, and you can't be intimidated by that. So, like, one thing some people might do, I'm just trying to make this up. Let's just imagine a hypothetical person who isn't quote unquote creative, which is silly. Um, they might have an idea. And then stick to that just because it they had a new idea that was connected to that. And if you change the new idea, then I'd have to go back to the old idea. And if you're seven ideas deep, it's so scary to go back and rip it up and rebuild and rebuild and rebuild. But if you're not afraid of those unknowns and how those unknowns connect to each other, um, I would say if there was this other quote unquote creative person, they would be more than willing and even enjoy that process of, breaking it down and starting again and again and again. And, and like you say, I like that puzzle analogy. Um, I guess, yeah, they would enjoy rearranging the pieces again and again and again to see how they fit together. You know, when you're talking about branching out, you know, that's something that I've seen too. You know, uh, when you're writing, you, you have a lot of, you know, options, you know what I mean? And, and you, you sort of go, well, okay, I can go option A, but if I go, or I can go option B, and then they sort of have their own sub branches, you know, and then sort of, it, it, there's a there's a phrase that I hope I remember correctly. I think it's called decision fatigue, where eventually oh, yeah. you get so tired because you're like, okay, well if I choose a 
you know, let's just say A2, like branching. And, and, and you know, and this is, this is I, I mean, whether we're coding or whether screenwriting, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're always sort of, whether either way, you know, there's a, I think there's a lot of overlay. But if you, you choose like option A, for instance, and you say, okay, we have two branches. I can go A1 or A2. If I choose A2, well, that makes, that changes everything else I already did. But if I choose B2, you know, and I think eventually, I think as we're writing, I think a lot of times decision fatigue causes us to stop more than it, you know what I mean I think it causes us to go oh geez but what if I did this you know what I mean and it, where you're sort of uh sitting there going oh man what should I do next I don't know oh man and I think that's when people sort of go online just sort of trying to figure it out you know what I mean I think they have to go all right let me just check Twitter real quick and I'll see if uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see if uh you know the decision comes to me while, while I'm on Twitter. I see that's interesting. I like decision fatigue, and that's where those distractions are nice because you can stop having to make decisions for a second and just zone out completely. Um, your, but telling me about decision fatigue reminds me of um, the. Uh, so another project I'm working on is uh, my YouTube channel, Art of the Problem, um, and that's a, a an hour long video series which explores the origin of modern fields of study and the way to do that. But my approach to doing that is looking for an ancient question that humans have always been solving and follow that question through time because the question never goes away, just our way of solving it does. And in writing those episodes, they're definitely the most difficult thing I've ever done. It's really a process of trying to rewrite history. Um, and, and that is something that I find most draining in the writing process. Yeah, the the old logic questions. I like that a lot because uh, there's one question uh, that that is, you know, I, I always go back to whenever I'm writing, and that question is why. Just literally, W H Y question mark, you know, mm -hmm. and it's sort of I think that you know that question has plagued philosophers throughout time and every and every culture and, and all, all over the planet. And I think that you know why W H Y question mark, if you could sort of figure out. Or maybe I shouldn't even use that term. Figure it out. Maybe if you can sort of m create an answer to that question, it will be your answer. But it's like you just said. It, it, it's sort of like the you know what, what everyone's going to have a different answer to that, and how people have answered it throughout time. Totally, um, it's really fascinating when you think about things through the lens of what is the driving question. And again, that's exactly what I do with Art of the Problem. It, it's a great way to look at the world. Um, and what you do find is it's amazing how the same question will have the most um, like opposing decisions are almost orthogonal to each other. And then the but the, the answers or the when I say decisions, I guess I mean solutions, the solutions to problems through different eras also reflect the era that you're living in, which is just I find very interesting. Yes. Yeah, and you know what? What, the, what does the culture say at that point? You know what? What is the country going through at that point? Because uh, I mean, personally, Brett, I think right now in America, it's like a reflash of the '70s. Uh, mm -hmm. Just, just culturally, economically, it just feels that way to me. I'm uh, mm -hmm. probably completely wrong, but uh, I think that's why why cinema is is getting back to that gritty, grindhousey feel, at least in the independent the independent side of things. Uh, you know, and I also you know, you know just just in in general, I think you know. Uh, I see a lot of uh, of um, parallels, but uh, but but you know, yeah, I mean, you know, problem solving and our perspective, how we solve those problems, even especially when we're writing, our, our perspective as we go into the to to, to write, you know, it, it's it's so important because I think you know when our perspective as we go in, that affects every decision we make. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you know, Brett. So uh, you know, as we're talking about you know storytelling, you know, and, and we're talking about Pixar in a box. You know, what if somebody was going to take the course, which is on Khan Academy, if someone was going to take the course, what's the, what's one thing, you know, you want them to take away from from the course? Um, I, I would say one is w w one interesting thing is that every topic on Pixar in a box is featured is, is taught by a different host. And the people we got to teach each lesson are actually the people who work in that department. So it's a rare case to really dive in, and if whatever the, your department you're interested in, whether it's rendering or whether it's storytelling, you can zoom in and, and actually get to meet that person. And we've included, um, aside from the lesson itself, which we've tried to make as engaging as possible, there's getting to know videos 
um, which I find really valuable. They're a four minute video. How, what did you do as a kid? How did you get here? Um, and watching all of those getting to know videos are, I find really fascinating because you see a lot of parallels, but it also can help you build a mental model for, you know, your own path. Yeah, you know, I, I started taking, uh, I actually watched the intro video and I was looking around too at the different lectures. Um, I, I like how, I think it's uh, I think it's labeled class two or level two. It's much more detailed in algorithms and computer science and, you know, sort of, you know, the, the real, real like atom level le uh, to, uh, of how things are actually created at Pixar. And the first level is actually getting, you know, getting an intro class. You know, you're seeing how, you know, all these things happen and you're, you're sort of, you know, seeing how, on the on the on the surface, you know how things are created too. Oh, you just reminded me of the 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 challenge with Pixar in a Box we faced was just that: what level of difficulty would these lessons be? And we batted that around a lot. What, like, what, if you're getting into math, when do you get into the math? And we finally landed on a model where we would break every topic into two pieces, and lesson one would be all about getting you comfortable with a process or a tool that they use. So with animation, you get you actually use a keyframe editor and, and you learn how to make a animate a realistic bouncing ball. Um, and then it's the second lesson where we peel back the layer of the onion, one layer, and we show you how those tools work. Um, and that division was really important because there's a lot of people who actually don't maybe care how the tools work. They just want to see what the tools are. So with this model, we were able to appease both crowds um, and i'm really happy we did that because every lesson one on pixar in a box and every topic you don't have to be worried about like rendering might sound really scary but guess what our rendering lesson doesn't require any mathematics but the second part does um so you don't have to worry about dipping your feet in anywhere and uh, so and and that's great i'm glad i could remind you by the way brent i'm glad again my my uh my uh ramblings uh help somebody out but uh but uh you know I, you know, when I saw Pixar in a box, I mean, it, it's just phenomenal. And uh, you know, do you have an anticipation date, an anticipated date of when you know uh, the whole storytelling uh, part of Pixar in a box will be up? Um, in 2017, we'll start rolling it out. We'll do it um, sequentially, so there'll be six lessons in that storytelling unit. And by the end of February, we will be rolling out our first one. Um, and then that'll roll into the summer. So by September next year, that whole storytelling curriculum will be finished. That that is that is amazing, Britt. Uh, you know, and I'm going to link to Pixar in a Box in the show notes. Uh, as it's, again, it's on Khan Academy, and uh, you know, Khan Academy is an uh, is an open sourced uh, online. Uh, what is it? Is is it classified as as a MOOC, uh, Britt? No, it's not classified as a MOOC because, you know, MOOCs are all about creating co packaged courses you can take, where Khan Academy is really trying to be there to help you with the concept you need so you can fill in the gap you need on whatever journey you're on. Um, so, it, you know, it's a resource, a free resource um, that spans many, many concepts, and it's designed so that you can, you know, jump in and out to, f to get the thing you need that you need help with. Versus, you know, a collection of packaged courses like like you see on the MOOCs. So it's different in that way. So, Britt, you know, just out of curiosity, do you ever think that these online classes are, are basically going to replace colleges? I don't think they'll replace colleges. I just think colleges will evolve. You know, I, I've... You know, I actually used to work at a college, and uh, a lot of some of the professors were actually talking about the MOCs and basically, you know, what they thought of them. And... I think the bigger colleges, like you know, the Ivy Leagues, will never have to worry about anything. You know, mm -hmm. no matter what. I think if if they're not actually teaching education, there'll be a there'll be a glorified summer camp. Uh, you know what I mean? I don't think mm -hmm. if college if if those colleges like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, if they adapt correctly, which they will, because they usually have incredibly smart people, you know, running them. I think they'll, that's what will happen. They'll, if they're not teaching education, they'll be, you know, sort of like almost like a hedge fund, uh, or or they'll they'll be like a you know a glorified summer camp. You know, go there for a summer, have fun or whatever. Um, I don't know because I, I mean I, I'm always interested about the future of education and the place of college. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's always interesting to me. I mean, to me honestly, I, I think the 
the, it, some people flourish at college, and 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 there's a, there's others like myself who struggled a lot in college. And I kind of look back, Britt, and I kind of don't really think my college education was really worth the cost, if you know what I mean. I feel the same way. Um, and I think that basically with free online education, what you can do is really raise the bar of what's expected of students when you enter school. And then you can focus less on making sure you know X, Y, and Z, and more on the collab collaborative nature of school and the project-based learning that goes on in school, which when I look back, yeah, a lot of the information I sat through, I, I just could have learned online, but there were a few very specific things I do remember, and everything I remember that was valuable going back to high school were the collaborative things. So drama in high school, biggest learning experience putting on plays for me. And then in school, I, I studied engineering. You know, it was working with a group of people to make a robot that could play the drums. Um, and it's it's in those collaborative environments that real learning happens. So I, I don't think that's going to go away. And, and, it, and I think the colleges will learn that and they'll just go more in that direction and less in, you know, lectures uh, maybe could be replaced with something else. Yeah, I also think MicroMasters are going to come become big. I see a lot of it, like on EDX and Coursia, uh, you know, just about creating a MicroMasters course, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing that more and more. But you know, it's just, um, but I'm, I'm glad you feel that way too, Brett. I mean, because you're an incredibly intelligent guy. So, uh, you know, I, there's a there's a guy, there's a book uh, that I read. It was called 100 or 50 50 or 100 Alternatives to College, written by mm -hmm. a guy named James Altucher, and I got to talk to James. Uh, probably about a year ago and, and not, not for the podcast. And he actually said the same thing. He actually got out of college with a degree and they had to send him somewhere else to learn how to code, even though his <laughs> degree was in computer science. And they said, you know, uh, Hey, you know, we're going to send you this boot camp. We're going to do all this and that. And finally he said, you know, what the hell was it worth? He said, I, I, I spent all this money going to college and I, I get bumped out. And now all of a sudden I, you know, we can't, I can't even code. I mean, what, what was the point of all that? Yeah, I can relate. That was kind of the same way. It's sad. Yeah, I mean, at my uh, former college, I actually used to teach uh, multimedia classes because they, the teachers that got hired to teach them didn't know how to do anything. Uh, and, and, I, and I mean that with all sincerity, but they, they mm -hmm. literally – one guy actually came to me and said, hey, Dave, I haven't picked up a camera in 15 years, and they want me to teach the video uh, – the introduction to video production class. So I had to sit down with him, and I said, okay, so we're going to be shooting through an SD card. Uh, we were using the uh, Panasonic HMC 150P. And I and I hit, hit record on the camera, and I said, now when I hit it again, it's going to create, it's going to start and stop that file, and that's its own digital file. And he says, whoa, he goes, Dave, wait a minute, you're going way too fast. Yeah. And I said, what? Well, I said, you're going to be teaching the course, and and I, and this is too fast. He his idea was he could stay one step ahead of the students by training with me. That was his secret plan. <laughs> <laughs> And it's only going to the speed only increases with time when it with technology, so it's a losing race. Yeah, it really is. I mean, the thing, I mean, that was his, I mean, because I think if he he was trying to get, you know, his head wrapped around the cameras, um, and it's just, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I'm so glad I, I don't teach there anymore or do anything there anymore, but um, but that, that was the sign. I, I think colleges like that are going to go under. I think all of these small private colleges that are, that live and breathe through having 100% enrollment are just going to all go under. That, again, when I graduated, uh, I did a computer science degree at McGill. I, again, struggled through the whole thing. And then I said it was so painful that I started a YouTube channel to just try to recommunicate what I had learned. And I had I'm doing I'm still doing that to this day. Um, and it's been very cathartic to, you know, spend months struggling on a video um, that was connected to months prior that struggling in school and then recommunicated in an eight minute video that then people say, ah, you opened my eyes, you made that clear for me. Um, and, uh, and I'll hear from people who either finish school and are still watching those videos because they, it feels good to have something clarified, but I'll also hear from people who haven't yet gone to university and will watch um, one of the, the Art of the Problem series and say like, that has changed my worldview. Now I'm going to school knowing what I wanna learn and that makes me very happy because when I went to school, I didn't know anything. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't have a firm grounding. And it's very sad that it wasn't until after school and communicating it back on YouTube that I fully absorbed the lessons I was supposed to learn in school. 
See, and, and that that's invaluable. I think that's why a lot of the times those online classes are are you know if I was a, if I was a high school senior right now, that's all I would be doing would be was would be doing online classes right now. Oh man, it's just a different world now, and the quality is increasing so quickly. Um, just five or six years ago on YouTube, if you were trying to learn, there was not a, a lot out there. Now, if you search anything, not only is it there, but there's probably six or seven versions of it, and the top version is probably really well produced. So things are trending in, in the right direction when it comes to finding online resources big time. And also, you can get the uh, – I, I just downloaded Unreal Engine 4, and it actually is the whole engine you can use to actually build video games, and it's 100% free and legit. That's so cool. That's a rabbit hole. I'd be scared to go down, but it sounds very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to make my own little per, uh, first-person shooter, just something very small and fun and just to have a laugh. And that, that is something – I mean, I, I have so many film projects I want to get done, but I was like, you know, let me just try this real quick and, you know, just trying it out. But that but that is something, too. I agree, Britt, that I would be like a rabbit hole. You know, uh, it, it would be hard to get back from, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, I've been. Wa I actually think that's great though. When you're stuck on something, to, to go work on a totally different project, I have to have three things on the go. It's the only way I work. Um, but c making a video game has always been in the back of my mind. But yeah, again, I just I know the hours involved, so I haven't even touched it yet. Yeah, it's uh, it, I, and from what I've heard, it's just very time consuming. <laughs> it's like it, it's just one of those things. But uh, there's so many scripts that I want to write and this and that, and you know, doing this podcast that sort of keeps up. Uh, you know, it keeps me busy enough. Um, but, uh, but you know, Britt, uh, you know, we've been talking for just about 45 minutes now. Uh, you know, is there anything sort of in closing uh, that we hadn't, haven't discussed yet that maybe that you wanted to bring up? Or is, is there anything you wanted to maybe mention just to sort of put a period at the end of the sentence? Um, I would just kind of amplify something I've been hearing lately, which is uh, this is a dawn of a new era where it is a world – Sorry, it's a dawn. Let me start again. I'm going to amplify something I've already heard a few times, which is that this is a new era that will be very friendly for creatives and people who create online. Um, where It's just starting to happen where we were in a world recently where you're either at the very top of your industry and you're making a ton of money or you were a nobody and you made no money. Um, but now people who can have generate, you know, small audience, whether it's 10,000, whether it's 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000, um, we're getting into a world where you will be able to sustain yourself. Um, and with things like the Internet Creators Guild, which I recommend anyone joining, which just launched this year, creatives online are, are starting to reorganize and the business models are changing. Um, YouTube's evolving if you're in the video medium. And I think if anyone is either starting now or they started a little while ago and, you know, they're not making any revenue from their art, I think just stick with it. Because in, in about five years, I think an Internet eyeball will be worth the same as a TV eyeball. And right now they're off by like two orders of magnitude. So I think we're getting into a new era where um, it's very creator friendly and, and you can kind of build your own audience from the bottom up and not have to attach yourself to some sort of machine to make a living. Yeah, I, I fall into the uh, the former camp, uh, the, sorry, the latter camp, uh, a nobody who makes no money. That's me, Brent. So hopefully, uh, <laughs> me too. I, I, know, I, I mean, you, you know, hopefully I can, I can do something. Uh, but, uh, but no, I mean, I wouldn't call you that, Brent, because, I mean, you know, you're a part of Pixar in a Box, you know, you did out of the problem, uh, you know, all, all this great stuff, Brent. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think you're a nobody. Uh, I think your podcast's great, and it's 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 just amazing to see people who just like plow away at something and just build it. I think the people building stuff online now in ten years are going to be very happy they did it. Well, thank you, Brett, because I, I I did this because I the whole reason I started this podcast, and uh, there are some people I've had since episode one. I can't believe they put up with a hundred and thirty some episodes of me talking, but it they have been here through episode one and. Um, the whole reason I started this podcast was because in 2014, I got passed over for a promotion that was rightfully mine. And I was so angry. I was so resentful. And I said, you know what? I want to do something creative that I can do very easily, very little bar barriers to entry. And bam, this is what the podcast has become. Awesome. I love it. So, Britt, where can people find you at online? Um, so, you know, my website is BrittCruz.com and I'm on Twitter. 
And um, Art of the Problem, uh, you can find me on YouTube. That's where I kind of publish the majority of my videos. And I'll link to that in the show notes as well, everybody. I'll link to also Pixar in a Box. And uh, also, but I, I uh, gave you a follow on Twitter, by the way. And I actually found your Twitter account before you uh, a couple days ago. I was like, oh, I'm going to make sure to follow him and uh, see, what he, we'll see what he's tweeting. And uh, you tweet you, you tweet a lot of interesting stuff, by the way. And uh, and uh, I like people like that who tweet, you know, really cool stuff. Right on. I follow you too. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. Um, but uh, Britt, I want to say thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to everything uh, that you that you come up with. And again, I'm looking very interested in Pixar in a Box season. Uh, uh, was it what we call season three? I guess we're gonna call it or. Is, yeah, season okay. three. Well, that's internal name, but it's a storytelling unit. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to that as well. And uh, everyone, DaveBullis.com, Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. Britt Cruz, I want to say thank you so much for coming on, and I really do want to wish you the best for everything. Thanks so much, Dave. Let's catch up again. Oh, yeah. Anytime you want to come back on, Britt, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to have you on. Thank you so much. Anytime, buddy. Take care. Cheers. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.